This episode is supported by Nanyang Vice. Nanyang Vice is one of the fastest growing and most well-received Mandarin horror podcasts in Southeast Asia. It focuses on urban legends, unsettling individuals, real crimes, and more. A unique movie-like thriller, the series puts you in the shoes of its protagonist, creating a terrifying auditory experience. Nanyang Vice frequently tops Apple Podcasts fiction list in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Malaysia, and Singapore. New episodes go up every Monday and Friday. Horror and ghost lovers, don't miss it. Ghost Maps Entry 61 Pulau Tekong, Singapore Nazri my second interviewee on this hungry ghost month evening, arrives just as my first interviewee, Gary, is leaving. They exchange some pleasantries, but don't really say much else to each other, since Gary has to head home to his family. If they did speak for a while longer, however, they'd realize they have a fair bit in common. Like Gary, Nazri is here to share a couple of encounters he had during this time of the year, when the barriers between our world and that of the supernatural are at their thinnest. And just like Gary, Nazri's encounters happened during his basic military training on Pulau Tekong. No matter how many ghost stories you hear about the island, some part of you just hopes that they're all nonsense, Nazri says, as he orders himself a teo at this Badok coffee shop. Or, even if they are true, you at least hope that it never happens to you. Nazri is a lecturer at an arts school these days. One of his students, Adam, was a former interviewee of mine and has followed me on a couple of other interviews. Adam actually asked if he could join us tonight, but Nazri requested that he not be here. I've mentioned to the class before, in passing, that I've got some army ghost stories, Nazri tells me. But it's one thing to casually talk about these experiences with my students, and a whole other thing to cross the line and have him hear the entire story. I personally know that Adam's made of sterner stuff, but I keep this to myself. Instead, I shift the conversation back to Nazri's experiences. Two of them, to be precise. You hope that it never happens to you. And then... It happens one after another, Nasri says with a laugh. With a smirk, I tell him that I understand how that can feel like. He laughs again, though he looks slightly embarrassed. I give him a reassuring smile. And as Nasri's Teo arrives, I switch my recorder back on and ask him to start from the beginning. It was 2007. Nazri and his fellow recruits were outfield in the jungles of Tekong, away from the comparative familiarity of their bunks. Even though this was during the Hungry Ghost Month, the recruits weren't given any special instructions by either their sergeants or their warrant officers. No warnings about being extra cautious about apologizing to any spirits that might be around before relieving themselves while in nature or about showing the proper respect to any statues or joysticks or offerings that they might come across in the jungles. Nazari says that he knew even then that this was not the norm that his superiors were being lackadaisical 
in their duties. But at the time, he wasn't going to question the same people who could dish out punishment if he seemed too insubordinate. So, together with the rest of his platoon, he went outfield, armed with the right equipment, but without the proper knowledge. Those first two days, however, went by uneventfully. Digging shell scrapes, heating up their less than appetizing looking rations, holding onto their rifles for dear life so that they didn't get yelled at by their sergeants, and really strengthening the bonds between each other. It was grueling for the recruits, but it was mostly nothing out of the ordinary. Mostly. During those first two nights, some of us could have sworn we heard someone laughing out in the jungle, Nasri tells me. We chalked it up to just some overactive imaginations. We all knew how flimsy that reasoning was. On the third evening, though, things changed. For one thing, it was unnaturally colder. The winds whipped at them violently, blowing over equipment and sending recruits huddling together for some sense of security. It was almost like the cold was attacking them. I mean, come on, on Tekong? Hell, anywhere in Singapore? No way that's normal, Nazri says. The chill, however, was only a precursor to what was to come. At around 8pm, Nazri was placed in charge of leading the men to the area where they'd dig up their latrines. Glamorous work, he says, with a humorless chuckle. Five of his platoon mates found quiet corners to attend to their business. None of them apologized or asked for permission. In retrospect, Nazri felt like this was the final straw. Whatever was in that jungle, it was being reasonable up to that point, he says, a far away look coming over him. It had given us two nights to show it some respect. Standing in a clearing, rubbing his arms as the weather seemed to grow colder, almost like the chill was closing in on him, Nasri suddenly saw a flash of white moving against the darkness of the surrounding trees. He didn't want to get a closer look, but he knew he had to. If he didn't, whatever was out there would only feel more slighted. So he flashed his torchlight's beam into the darkness of the jungle. It felt like the light almost moved, in slow motion illuminating the oppressive gloom of his surroundings inch by inch instead of all at once. Nasri knows that can't be true, but it suddenly felt that way at the time, he tells me. Soon, the light revealed what was waiting for him. Out there, amidst the trees and the darkness, was an elderly man in traditional attire, grinning. It certainly wasn't a pleasant expression, but it wasn't even maliciously playful either. Somehow, his lips stretched from ear to ear, his yellowed 
crooked teeth bared. And behind all of that was anger. I wanted to run, Nazri tells me. But I, I couldn't. I don't know if it was fear or something else, but I was frozen there. To make matters worse, the man started moving towards Nazri. He can't recall precisely how he moved, though. Sometimes I remember him just walking slowly, he says. Other times he was crawling like, like a spider. Sometimes he was floating and sometimes, somehow, it was all three. However, the man made his way towards him. Nazri definitely remembers what he did next. He prayed. He kept his eyes open the whole time, unblinkingly watching the man as he came closer and closer. Nazri couldn't bring himself to meet his gaze directly. Instead, he just stared at that hungry grin. And he kept praying. And after what felt like far too long, Nazri couldn't keep his eyes open. He blinked. And when he opened his eyes again, the man was gone. Finally, regaining control of his senses, Nazri yelled for the other recruits to finish up whatever they were doing. And together, they all quickly made their way back to where the rest of the platoon were. Nazri tried telling his sergeant what had happened, but his superior just waved him off and even yelled at him for taking too long. I just took the scolding, he tells me. Honestly, after what I faced in the jungle, an angry sergeant was nothing. But then he sighs and adds, I just wish it was the last thing I had to deal with that night. Exhausted from his ordeal, it didn't take long for Nasri to fall asleep in his shell scrape, even knowing what was out there. He figured that if the man really wanted to do something horrible to him, he would have done it already. And he did leave Nasri alone for the rest of the night, except to give him a warning. Around four in the morning, Nasri woke up to the sound of something moving and the shell scrape in front of him. I only remembered later that this was the demo shell scrape that our sergeant had dug. He says, no one should have been in there. Groggily, Nasri opened his eyes and thought for a second that he saw a soldier standing in the shell scrape. He didn't recognize this soldier, but he was also not entirely awake yet, so he didn't think much of it at the time. Still, he knew immediately that there were a couple of things wrong. For one, the soldier was dressed in the old Tamasic green uniform from the 60s. Another thing that stood out was that he had his rifle out and aimed at Nazri's buddy Vivek. Nazri blinked, hoping to clear out the blariness, but where the soldier was a second ago, the elderly man stood instead. 
The man was not looking at him, though. Nazri was at least thankful for that. But, like the soldier before, the man was staring directly at Vivek, he tells me. Nazri blinked again. This time, the shell scrape was empty. I was ready to call it a nightmare, he says. I mean, it all happened in that state between sleep and consciousness. But then, when we returned to our bunks a few days later, Nazri shivers. He apologizes and says he needs another drink before he continues. I tell him it's absolutely fine and turn to call the drink stall auntie over, but then stop before I can wave to get her attention. Standing at the stall is a soldier. Not an NS man who's just come back from camp. But a soldier in a Tamasic green uniform. I guess, Bart. No. A little too loudly. And Nasri asks if I'm okay. I quickly turn back to him to reassure him to tell him I'm fine and that there's nothing, nothing at all, to worry about. But when I turn back, the soldier's gone. I pause for a moment. This isn't the first incident since my accident. I thought I might have just been tired, but this is clearly more than burnout. Something's going on. And I decide that I need to explore this to figure out what's happening. But after tonight, after I finished these Hungry Ghost Month interviews, I wave to the drink stall auntie then turn back and as best as I can keep up my brave front for Nasri as he gets ready to tell me the second part of his story. If you want to discover more of Southeast Asia's other side, subscribe now and follow us on social media. You can also be one of our supporters on Patreon. Look for We Are Huntu or click the links in the description. Ghost Maps is a Huntu production, created by Kyle Ong and Wayne Ray, with art direction by Jolene Lim, and recorded on Audio Technica Mics. <laughs>